you. Uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to today's symposium on water governance in Hong Kong. Um, we have got a, a stellar lineup uh, for you today. But uh, before, is, is Lolita around somewhere? Good. Um, before, before I go on, I, I know of uh, extreme thanks is merited uh, for our senior research associate, Ms. Lolita Cole, who helped to organize this, get everybody here on time. Um, I, I kid you not, if she was not here, this would be a darkened room. There would be nobody in here, and I would just be listening to basically the echo of my voice on the walls, which, come to think of it, isn't necessarily bad. Um, anyway, um, basically today I, I would like to uh, uh, present to you a, 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 an agenda that we've all devised together. The intent is essentially to construct a book that investigates uh, water challenges in Hong Kong. And um, we're, we're very excited about uh, the group of speakers that we have because it's, it's truly a multidisciplinary group. It's not just focused on Hong Kong. We've got uh, people from uh, overseas sharing experiences from different markets. We've got um, a professor from uh, Zhongshan University in, in, uh, in Guangdong who is going to be sharing with us the perspective from that side. We've got a professor from, from, from mainland who's going to be uh, sharing with us uh, some broader uh, insights from China water policy. So it should be a very interesting schedule today. With that said, should we even really be here? Um, is Hong Kong's water situation a cause for alarm? Or is this just you know, another example of, of uh, a group of academics trying to justify a free lunch by getting together to talk about some irrelevant issue? Well, in order to, I think, begin to answer that, uh, the way that I would analyze this as a policy person is to explore uh, water security through a framework. And the framework that I use is, is the Nuan is the alarm framework. So the essence of this is that if you have, if you have uh, a, a, a group that is trying to plot a water strategy for a given nation, essentially the first thing, one of the things that you're looking at is whether or not you have constant availability and access to the supplies. Another metric that you want to try to measure is, is the availability and access coming at a cost? So are there any unintended consequences? Are there any negative externalities associated with this? And so I, I call this uh, linkages. And of course, the, the third uh, element that you need to be cognizant of is, is, is it affordable? But not just affordable, is it something that you know, everybody can afford? The fourth criteria is resilience. So does the system itself have the proper properties that will allow it to withstand any changes, any sudden unexpected changes? And the fifth one, of course, is, is mechanisms of good governance. And, and why do I think this is important? Well, because taxpayers' money goes into supporting most of the water systems around the world. And so you know, people have a right to know where their taxpayers' money is going, how much it's costing, and, and how that money is being managed. So I thought the best way to start, because uh, I, I have, have nowhere near the eminence of the rest of our speakers, is, is to bumble my way through a, a small review of these five criteria in regard to Hong Kong's water strategy. So let's look at the first one, which is availability and access. Um, as you can see here, uh, Hong Kong is largely dependent on uh, imported water. Uh, and projecting forth into the near future, as you can see, this isn't going to change very much. Now, the, the concern here is not just that it's dependent on imported water, but that it's dependent on water that's coming from essentially one watershed area. And as a result of that, the health of that watershed area is crucial for the future of, of Hong Kong. It is Friday. Um, 
The, the other point to note is that this was not always the case. You know, historically, uh, Hong Kong uh, had embarked during colonial times on a program of expanding reservoirs, and in doing so, was attempting to uh, ascertain a degree of water security. And in 1984, this very important uh, declaration was signed between the, uh, the British uh, authorities here and the Chinese government, which guaranteed supplies from Guangdong province. And of course, as you can see, since that time, it was almost an immediate change. And suddenly, you know, uh, the availability of, of water went from water shortage times. And I, you know, I've got friends that have been here since the 70s, and they remember those days. And I'm sure that many of you that were around remember those days. And we've gone from that to a position now where there really aren't any water shortages. So no one really talks about water anymore. But nevertheless, the important point to mention here is that this dependence on water that's coming from the East River, the Dome River, is in, indeed increasing. And that's going to be exacerbated by projections that we're going to see an increase in population here in Hong Kong. Uh, approximately one million new people are projected over the next 20 years. Of course, with each new person is you know, a, a bit more water demand. That's exacerbated by the fact that there's 40 million people in the Pearl River Delta region that are living predominantly in five cities that are drawing water from the same tributary, from the same watershed. And as a result of that, as you can see here, and Sue, Sue I've, I've, I've actually, I've drawn, I've taken this from, uh, from Civic Exchange. But Sue, I, I changed this, I think this is a, this used to say 74, and I believe this is, this is a typo, it's 14, isn't it? Um, which, which this, this top, this top number. This one? Yeah. No, it, no, 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 no. It was 74. Uh, that's, uh, the story of that paper is, uh, Dongjiang only supplies to one district of Guangzhou. Okay. And then 74 is for the Guangzhou overall. Okay. So, that's the figure it should be 71. 70, okay. 74. Okay. 74. Okay, so 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 that that notwithstanding, because it's difficult to, to make the comparison, but as you can see here, you know, across the board, except in Weizhou, there's there's increases compared to the allotment. And as a result of that, these cities, these municipalities have been drawing from uh, Hong Kong's uh, allotment surplus. Uh, the point is, is that there is uh, in increasing demand right across the board for, for water that's coming out of this river. And as you can see here, the 2020 estimated demand, there's going to be some significant elevations. And the problem is, where does that come from, I think, is the question. So overall, I think if we're looking at our first criteria, we have to assign a, a, a slight level of concern to, to access. So I, I've, I've given it one poopy face. Um, the second criteria is linkages, and, and uh, again, going back to this data, uh, you can see here that you know you've got all of this increased demand on a fixed source. There is no more water that's being created in the river, and so because of that, it, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that you know there is going to be a, an increased amount of ecological damage that's happening, and that is most certainly the case. If you look at some of the some of the, the pictures that, that uh, Civic Exchange has taken in one of their expeditions along the river, you'll you, you can see you know this is this is one of the key key, key reservoirs at Wanlu Lake, and as you can see, just massive development going on around this reservoir. But it's not development that's occurring in a in a responsible manner. I mean, you've got you know sort of all of the sedimentation and, and silting that's occurring. Not to mention the fact that alongside the river, you're coming across, um, you know, all of these uh, examples of really sort of uh, unmetered, unregulated development, pollution. This is a this is an, a photo taken of a rare earth metal processing area, and of course that means the tailings are being washed into the river and uh, need to be dealt with uh, downstream, which is extremely difficult for for rare minerals. 
Now, the problem with this, of course, is that it's, it's fueling strained relations. I mean, you only need to be in Hong Kong for about a week to understand that you know, relations between the mainland and Hong Kong are already uh, at levels that are, that are a bit uncomfortable. And you know, this could go either way. I mean, one way it can go is uh, Hong Kong continues along the path that it's going, and uh, conditions in uh, Guangdong province start to become worse. And as a result of that, it you know will will stir up a, a higher degree of resentment from the Guangdong side. The other way it can go is is that Hong Kong can start to you know pay its way for the ecological damage that's being created in the Crow River Delta area. In which case, the people in Hong Kong will face higher rates and of course a, a higher degree of animosity. So strained relations is, is definitely uh, an aspect of, of what's happening here. And so, uh, you know, once again, I would have to assign a degree of concern to this element. Third area is affordability. And as you can see here, um, the, uh, compared to Singapore, which is typically used as, as sort of both a benchmark of excellence and, and, the, and the competitive rival of Hong Kong, you can see that uh, the cost of drinking water here in Hong Kong is not only uh, one of the lowest in the world, but it's also, you know, uh, one third that of, of Singapore. So, you know, that that's actually perhaps positive, except when you realize that this is because there's a there's a structure here that's designed to disincentivize conservation, and as a result of that, you know, you you've got uh, per capita levels that are, uh, you know, disproportionately high here. As you can see, I'll just point out two areas here. The first 12 cubic meters of domestic use are free. So, you know, as civic exchange points out in their reports, this leads to uh, actually a high proportion of, of Hong Kong citizens that pay, you know, little or nothing for their water. Uh, similarly here, in terms of seawater flushing, Hong Kong is one of the few areas in the world that uses seawater for, uh, uh, for toilet flushing. And uh, it, it uh, comprises about 20% of water usage here. But the system is structured in a way that it's free. So 80% of the households that rely on the system have this free service. There's no disincentive to discourage. And this, of course, when you have incentives, you have fiscal expenses, fiscal burdens. Now, this is okay for Hong Kong right now because, you know, the Hong Kong authorities are running at a, a very high uh, fiscal surplus. You know, so times are good. But nevertheless, you know, uh, anyone that looks at a chart like this says, well, you know, is it really worth spending this much money on subsidies? So that these, this would be the equivalent of three to four billion Hong Kong dollars on subsidies water. So again, in terms of affordability, yes, it's cheap, but it's coming at a cost. It always comes at a cost, and it's something that I think we need to be uh, cognizant of. Third area is resilience. So the ability to, to, to withstand um, uh, you know, sort of any ecological change that, that might occur, or any change of any, of any sort. And of course, one of the corollaries to this increased demand for water from the same river is the fact that waste discharge is increasing. As you can see here, over the last 10 years, um, waste discharge has increased almost 50%. This is causing some severe problems. Um, you know, there are actually medical wastes that are being you know, dumped into the river that, that need to be dealt with because they pose a health risk. So the end result here, is uh, degraded quality. And as you can see from this map, you know, here we are in the Hong Kong area. Grade four, grade five is polluted. Exceeding grade five is extremely polluted. You can't even use the water. So, you know, look, this is sort of the, the, the path that we're dealing with. And as you can see here, all downstream, we've got these massive problems occurring. So again, uh, I think, we have significant cause for concern. Now, our, our final criteria needs to start with acknowledgement. Um, you know, governing water is not easy, uh, and it's highly politicized. 
And you know, there's people in, in the uh, water supplies department that are working hard and take great pride in what they're doing. And you know, that, that shows in exemplary service records. But of course, the service records are, are uh, underpinned by this uh, Sino-British agreement. The Water su Supplies Department is also taking steps. They've got this program called Total, Total Water Management that they published, and you can access online if you're interested. But you know, here are some of the highlights. Basically, the overall goal is they wish to, to, to save 236 uh, cubic mil, uh, mil, million cubic meters of water by 2030. Now, that sounds incredible, doesn't it? 236 million cubic meters. But you know, if, if you factor this over the 24 years of the program, you know, that's to 9 million cubic meters a year, which is you know, about 8%, 7% of, of Hong Kong's water usage now. Now, considering you've got 15% leakage in the system, uh, it doesn't take a lot, a lot of uh, work to actually make up for this 9 million cubic meters. <coughs> Nevertheless, there's clear indications of you know, the emergence of some sort of strategy. You know, there's, there's attempts to, be, to, to educate the public better. <coughs> there's this uh, well scheme, water efficiency labeling scheme that the uh, Water Supplies Department would like to unveil. Um, there's, they would like to extend seawater flushing, improve catchments. That doesn't mean expand catchments, but actually you know, improve the, the quality of of how they're managed. And a number of new initiatives, you know, looking at water reclamation, desalination. <coughs> the problem is, is that not a lot of these have set goals. So, you know, as they say, you, you, can't, you can't manage what you don't measure. So if you don't have very clear goals, um, you know, you don't have very clear direction. As a result of that, you know, we have, you know, fairly, fairly small goals that, that have been set. So, what does this mean? Well, in terms of quality of governance, and, and again, I think most of these conclusions, um, you know, those that civic exchange would agree with, you know, the idea of adopting user pay systems rather than this mass subsidization would certainly play a big role in conserving water here. Um, having clearer targets would focus people in the water supplies department better and, and give the department up a, a benchmark from which they can start to measure costs and benefits. Reducing leakage, 15%. Um, well, I mean, just to put it in perspective, I think Tokyo is uh, three. So there's a lot of room to move there. And if you're if you're if you're losing basically one in every six liters that's coming through the pipeline, that's that's a real issue. Um, developing alternatives, to, to have a strategy that says we wish to develop alternatives as a recipe for disaster or a recipe for failure. You know, it's not enough to develop. You've got to set your standards, what you're trying to achieve, uh, when are you going to achieve them, uh, what is going to be the impact. And so far, I, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, it might exist, but we don't get to see it because it's not, you know, for public record. And that's a little bit disappointing because this is a public agency. In terms of transparency, um, there's, there's a clear need for more you know, uh, public consultation so that people are aware of, of the situation. The vast majority, and it's indicated here, um, this is a really serious issue. And we've got 30 people. We, we sent out invitations to probably 6,000 people. Um, and we've got 30 people talking about an issue that is of critical uh, concern for, for Hong Kong going forward. In terms of accountability, which is my last point here, um, the, the thing I would like to say is this. If you think about Hong Kong, there's kind of two sectors of society or two belief systems, two views. The first view is we want Hong Kong to be more independent. We don't like what's happening. The other view is we want to integrate more with China. This is the way, the wave of the future, and it's going to happen. So it doesn't matter what side you're on. You know, these concerns need to be addressed now. If you're on the independence side, it should be obvious that there's a need for greater water independence here in Hong Kong. But if you are on 
the pro-linkage with China side. The point is, is that Hong Kong is but a player in the Pearl River Delta. It has a responsibility, just like all of the other municipalities that rely on the water. And so therefore, if Hong Kong wants to play a positive role as part of the larger Hong Kong fam uh, China family, it needs to consider playing a more positive role in terms of water governance. So on either side, there's, I think there's uh, strong reasons to, to want to support this. So again, uh, cost for concern. <coughs> which leads us to, to this, which is, I, I took these happy faces, by the way, from CLP, who loves to do this for energy. Um, it, the only thing is they, they don't support their happy faces with data, but um, other than that, uh, I, I think it's very useful for you to, uh, to get an idea of, of what we're looking at here uh, in terms of water security. There are causes for concern. They're very clear. You're going to hear a lot more about this uh, this morning from uh, a, a lot more sagacious individuals than, than I. Um, we've got a line up here where we're going to start out the morning by talking about the, the situation in Hong Kong. Then we're going to move to a broader perspective so that you can understand what's happening and how the concerns in Hong Kong fit into China's broader water concerns. Uh, and then once we've uh, thoroughly depressed you, we'll break for lunch uh, so you can all go out and have gins and, and feel better. And when you come back, we'll talk in the afternoon about um, you know, some of the examples from around the world uh, where, you know, where they face similar challenges and perhaps uh, discuss how some of these uh, challenges can fit into to the uh, to the current situation here. And I, I, I truly do, and we all I, I know I can speak for all of the speakers here. We encourage those of you in the audience to participate uh, vociferously in, in the uh, Q and A because the idea here is again trying to map out the uh, the framework of a book that's going to deal with these issues and, and by receiving your input, I think we can start to hone in our, our own uh, individual chapters. So, so with that said, uh, I, I shall stop rattling on now. I've, I've, I've tried to delay as long as possible.